Many things that are done in churches and called worship today would never be done if they saw God for who He was. Uh, in His presence, they would not do that, could not do that, because of His greatness and the awe of His majesty. And so I appreciate that you're not looking for entertainment. That's not your interest. You desire to seek the Lord. And um, that is uh, certainly the Lord's desire for His church. Well, we come to the psalm. We're going to Psalm 4. This book of the Psalms, of course, is such a blessing. And uh, we enter into the heart of God as we think of our theme for this book is How to Walk with God, our, our title I've given to this series. And certainly that's the case. The Psalms is teaching us how to walk with God. Proverbs teaches you how to walk and live with men. But Psalms teaches you how to live with God, how to walk with Him. And the Bible, of course, is simply a revelation that God's given us of Himself. And uh, it's His written revelation uh, to us of Himself. The historical record and circumstances for Psalm 4 is the same as we saw last week in Psalm 3. You'd find it in 1 Samuel, or 2 Samuel uh, chapter 15 through 18. This is an evening psalm, and Psalm 3 was the morning psalm. And so uh, this is the psalm after the first 24 hours is over, and now uh, he's laying down to sleep the next night. And so uh, things have, some of the hotness of what was happening has simmered down a little bit. Absalom has failed to follow up on his advantage. Had he listened to the counsel of Ahithophel, he would have uh, sought David immediately and went after him before David had time to get recruits in and have people come to his aid, which is what happened. Um, and so uh, here now he's writing this psalm, and he says to the chief musician on Neganoth, a psalm of David, and uh, Neganoth has the idea of uh, a harp, a stringed instrument. And the, to the chief musician, this is the first time we see that term. It's as the idea of to the music director, to the music minister. Get this, this is a psalm, a song for him. Uh, this is one that he wants sung, and uh, pretty amazing. And we'll see that as we go through this psalm. Let's begin in verse 4, if you would. Uh, begin in, excuse me, Psalm 4. We're going to read the whole passage, Psalm 4. Hear me when I call. The idea there is, answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. O ye sons of men, how long will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love vanity and seek after leasing? Selah. Pause. Stop and think about that. What do you think of that? Verse 3, but know that the Lord hath set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Selah. Offer the sacrifice of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. There be many that say, who will show us any good? Lord, lift thou up the light of thy countenance upon us. Thou hast put gladness in my heart, more than in the time than their, that their corn and their wine increased. I'll both lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. I want to bring the message tonight titled, for himself. I want you to notice in verse 3 what, G, what the Lord says here. But know that the Lord, Jehovah, hath set apart him that is godly. Notice. What's the next two words? For himself. For himself. <laughs> For himself. Let's pray together. Father, help us now. We praise you that we are yours. We want no other father, Lord. We, we want no other master. Uh, you are our shepherd, and a good shepherd, a, a great shepherd, the chief shepherd. And Lord, we're praising you that we belong to you, and that you have set us apart for yourself. We love you. Teach us now from this psalm, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It's amazing to me that the Lord wants me. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it, that the Lord wants you? Why would He ever want me? Why would He ever want you? 
truly, it's his amazing grace, isn't it? That he desires you, that he would seek you. I mean, maybe if we would get down and crawl and beg and, and plead with the Lord, maybe, maybe if we came to him and crawled up and showed our penitence, he would finally receive us. But that's not how he operates. In fact, when you weren't looking for him, he was looking for you. When you didn't care about him, he cared about you. When you didn't know his name, he knew yours. He was seeking us. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. What a savior we have that wants us. And he's created us. You know why he loves you and me? He created us for himself. He's our maker. And he desired that we would bring him pleasure. That's why we were created, the Bible says. And he wants us for himself. He wants us to be for him like he is for us. He wants us to be for him and him alone. That our life would be all about him who died for us. What a savior we have. What a father that we've been given. And David's been driven out of his inheritance by Absalom. But David knows that his true inheritance is not material things. His true inheritance was spiritual. And God could not be taken from him. No one could drive him out of that. His true inheritance was in the Lord. And this psalm speaks of our needs today, just like David's needs then. Whether a penitent sinner, whether a, a pilgrim saint, it speaks of our needs. And I want to see the five themes of this psalm. Number one, salvation. Look at verse one and two. Hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness. Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. O oh, ye sons of men, how long will ye turn my glory into shame? How long will ye love vanity and seek after leasing? Selah. And you see here, first, it's a personal salvation. Notice in verse 1, he says, Hear me when I call, O God, of my righteousness. Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. You know, you can be philosophical about things until all of a sudden you see your need. And then it's not philosophical anymore. It's real. You can talk about uh, what the Bible teaches about salvation until all of a sudden you understand you're lost. And you need a Savior. There's two guys on the beach and one guy was just up on the sand. The other guy was just wading out in the water. He thought it was just, you know, a knee waist height where he could wade out. All of a sudden, he stepped off what was the edge, what he thought was going to be a shallow area, and just kind of stepped off this edge in the water and was going down. And he hollered back to the guy on shore, Help! Help! I, I can't swim! And the guy on the sand said, Neither can I, but I'm not making a fuss about it. <laughs> see, the guy on the sand didn't see his need, but the guy that had stepped off that shelf underneath the water recognized, I need help, I don't swim. And that's how it is for us sometimes. We don't realize our great need of God until suddenly we go off into the deep water and think, boy, I need God. I need the Lord. We need help. I need Him to come. And he says, me, my, me, my. He's talking specifically personal. The word distress there in verse 1 he says, Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. The word distress has the idea literally to be pressed into a corner. There's pressure. He's being pressed into a corner, pressed into a tight place. And he says, God enlarged me. The idea is the Lord picked him up and set him in a broad place. He was being pressed out of measure. He was being put in a tight place and God's picked him up and set him in a broad place. He's enlarged me. God enlarged me. David grew spiritually because of difficult situations. You know, it's interesting. God wants to enlarge you. He wants to enlarge your heart. And sometimes we want, Lord, enlarge my ministry. Lord, give me a greater ministry. But God doesn't enlarge ministries. He enlarges men and women. He enlarges our hearts for ministry. He gives us a heart to reach out to someone. Even what Jesus said, I will build my church. He wasn't talking about an organization he wasn't talking about a corporation. He was talking about the people, the church. I will build my church. And as God gives people that will have a heart for people, guess what? There will be more people. And he'll enlarge us. And David had a shepherd's heart. 
Uh, God said that he sought a man that would shepherd his people and have a love for his people, that would sit on the throne of his people, that would have a heart, a man after my own heart, that would love them and be a shepherd to them. He had an enlarged heart. He had a heart for these people. He desired God to work in these people. And so there are many that have walked and you, some of them are you tonight. You've walked in different situations that were like the valley of the shadow of death. Uh, people that have seen their children and they're concerned, they're broken because their children and something happened in their children's lives. They've been broken, they've been hurt. Who's going to put their arm around people like that? Who are going through a valley like that? Who's going to comfort them? There's ladies and men that have borne great disappointment and great hurt in their life. And they took it to the Lord. And the Lord sustained them. The Lord, they found His grace was sufficient. And you know what? The Lord wants to use those people to comfort others. See, trouble born in the Spirit of Jesus Christ God enlarges us now to help other people and have a heart for others. Listen to what God says in 2 Corinthians 1, 3 to 4. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. There will be people here on Monday at 1215 that have lost their dad. Some of you have lost your dad. They've lost their dad and mom in less than a year. Some of you have lost your dad and mom. You can put your arm around and say, I know what you're dealing with. I know the hurt. I know the loss you feel. And you want to pick up the phone and call them, and you can't. And, and some of those things like that, and you say, you know what? The Lord, my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord take me up. And I know they haven't forsaken you in, the, in a way that they're just run off on you, but they're not there. But God, he never leaves us and forsake us. He's always there. You can boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. And so uh, there's people all around us at all different times in life. And you think, why did I deal with this? Why have God allowed me to go through this thing? The Lord wants us to be enlarged. He wants us to find his grace is sufficient. But he also wants us to be able to then help others as they face that. And we show them their God is the same God that brought them through. And God will bring you through that trouble, that problem. We've got to help people to... Uh, it's not about boasting in your ability to get through a difficult situation. It's about giving God the glory for getting you through and telling others that the same God can get through, them through. We've got to help them to see that God is not doing something to you. God is doing something for you. Our God never is doing something to us. He's doing something for us. He's a loving God. He's a good Father. He, he is a perfect Father, and everything He does is for our good and for His glory. And so uh, to understand, I've talked to people that have been bitter about, at God and mad at God, but we have to recognize we have nothing to be mad about. The Lord is good. He can be nothing else. Notice verse 2. The Bible says here, O oh, ye sons of men, how long will ye turn my glory into shame? How long? Will you love vanity and seek after leasing? Selah. We see not just a personal salvation, but a practical salvation. Um, he's dealing with uh, a need here. He needs the Lord to answer and help. He, he's speaking out against those that turned on him. And these sons of men, when he says that, he's talking about ranked men. These are people of rank that had turned with Absalom and now are leading the people to follow a, a false king, to follow a king that was not king at all. David was so careful all of his uh, years before God raised him up and put him on the throne that he would not lift his hand against the Lord's anointed. But Absalom and all these others, even Ahithophel, whose counsel was like the oracles of God, all had turned and gone with Absalom. And David's calling them out, speaking out against them. The word leasing there at the end of verse 2 is an old English word for lying or falsehood. And he's saying, how long are you going to seek lying, seek falsehood? Aren't you glad you're not home watching the Democratic debate tonight on CNN? Of all the candidates, they, they were last night. I didn't watch it then either, but I heard about it. But the truth is, there's so much falsehood, so much lying. God's saying here, how long are you going to seek after that? 
You know, men seek what they love. Men seek what they love. You can tell me what you're trying to get. You tell me what you're seeking. I'll tell you what you love. You're seeking the Lord. You're seeking His will. You're seeking to God to use you to fish for men. You find someone that loves God. You find someone that's seeking that promotion. You find someone that's seeking after money. You find someone that's seeking after position. You find someone that loves money, that loves position, that loves power. We preach Sunday, you cannot serve God and mammon. He says, this is what you're seeking. Lying, falsehood. You guys have, you guys have swallowed a lie. A lie of the devil. David wanted his salvation to be so thorough, so complete, so beyond question, it would shut the mouths of the enemies of God. He's calling out to them, oh, how long will you turn my glory into shame? It wasn't his glory, it was the Lord's glory. Now, God had given him the throne. That's the way it was with George Mueller of Bristol. Before George Mueller was 10 years old, he was already an accomplished thief. The night his mother died, he had, was so drunk, his half drunk, wandering the streets, had a wild night with his friends. He disgraced himself from one school to another, even in a divinity school. He was trained to be a minister of the gospel, supposedly. He was up to no good. He was borrowing money, constantly in debt. Uh, he was uh, up to tricks and schemes to supply his lack of funds. He was aware no church was going to call him to be the pastor in the sinful condition he was in. And he tried in vain to reform his life. But then God saved George Mueller. <laughs> Transformed him. Gave him a ministry, and Mueller determined to establish a group of orphan houses. That's what we know him for. He did, decided the Lord had led him to do it in a way which would strike dumb the voices of atheism in England. He would keep his financial needs secret between him and the Lord. He'd been a schemer, wanted to swindle people out of their money before that, but he says, I'm not even going to tell anyone. Him and God alone. This is what he said, if I, a poor man, could get means to carry on an orphan house, it would demonstrate that God is faithful and still hears prayer. He succeeded. When he died, a very old man, Bristol, went into mourning. Businesses uh, closed for the day. Employees uh, all over the city lined the streets to witness the passing of George Mueller's body. They talked about the greatest, one of the greatest men they'd ever known. The Bristol paper uh, said, Mr. Mueller was raised up to show us that the age of miracles is not past. Uh, Professor Rendell Short, one of the Bristol's foremost surgeons of the next generation, said, My father used to say that during the days of George Mueller, agnosticism did not dare to raise its head in Bristol. Because people would point to Mueller and say, there's a man that's seen miracle after miracle what God has done. Salvation. Salvation. I'll tell you, that is the kind of salvation our God still offers. It turns a drunk, someone living wicked life, to someone that is not just sober but on fire for the Lord. A change of life. Our God's still saving people like that. I'll tell you tonight, if you don't know the Lord as your Savior, He wants to save you just like that. It doesn't matter how bad a person you are, man or woman, boy or girl. If you come to him, repent of your sin by faith. Trust him in what he did on the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection for you. He'd save you tonight. That's the God we serve. He is looking for a people for himself. True worshipers for himself. Now, that's the first theme of Psalm 4. But salvation is always followed by something else. Sanctification. Notice verse 3 and 4. But, uh, but no... Know that the Lord hath what? Set apart. There's your definition for sanctification. Set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Selah. There's nothing mysterious about sanctification. Sometimes we wonder about that. But listen to Philippians 2.12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. See, sanctification is just the practical outworking in the life, on the outside, of what's already happened on the inside. 
God's eternal, irrevocable, majestic work has taken place in the soul of man, in the inside. And, and sanctification is just that coming out, that being visible in the everyday life, what's happened on the inside. It's separation unto the Lord and from the world. Separation unto the Lord and from the world. Look, if light comes in, it begins to crowd out darkness. It can't help it. You turn the light on, darkness dissipates. And Christ will come into your life and he'll crowd out things of the world. You don't have to force it. You don't have to make it happen. Christ in you will begin to do that as you yield to him every day. The truth is the will of God for your life the moment you get saved is to be filled with the Spirit. He indwells you immediately, but you have to give him control every day. And as we give him control... You cannot sin. That's what 1 John's talking about, saying you, it's impossible for you to sin. As long as you're under spirit control, you could not sin. You can't sin. Why? Because the Holy Spirit of God is living within you, and He's in control. The moment you sin, you know, I'm not being filled with the Spirit. I've taken the reins back, and I need to, again, yield. The Christian life is a surrendering life. It's a yielding life. You want to walk with God? You have to humble yourself, because God resisteth the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. He says, submit yourself to the Lord. He says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and he'll lift you up. Yes, and so that's the Christ whole of the Christian life is just that, submitting to him and letting the Lord work out what has already been worked in. First, God saves us and makes us alive spiritually. He puts a spirit in us, then he sanctifies us. Being set apart for God makes us love the things we used to loathe, like coming to prayer meeting on Wednesday night. That wasn't something that interested you at all before you were saved. But now, you have a desire for it. What's happened in you? What's changed? The Lord Jesus has made all things new, see. And by, not only that, it, be, it makes us begin to loathe the things we once loved. My uh, principal, when I was in school in Steinbeck, before my, probably my, oh, I don't remember how many grades, probably four or five grades, but Anyway, his name was Mr. Tremaine, and uh, he used to smoke before he got saved. And he said, still to this day, I can walk by someone smoking and tell you what brand of cigarettes they're smoking. And uh, he said, it makes him sick to be around it, though. He couldn't stand it. He loathed it. He hated it. Before he got saved, that's what he loved. He loved cigarettes, loved to smoke. And he's think about things in your life that you maybe used to love and now it makes you sick to see it, sick to be around it. And things you didn't want, like be around godly people, be around church people, be in church, read your Bible, pray, now it's the things you love. A lady once said to the old Moody, Mr. Moody, I wish you'd tell me how to be a Christian. But I don't want to be of your kind. <laughs> I don't want to be one of your kind. He said, I didn't know I had a particular kind. What's the matter with my kind? She said, well, I've always gone to the theater. Indeed, I'm far better acquainted with theater people than I am church people, and I don't want to give up the theater. Mr. Moody said, when have I ever said anything about going to theaters? We have reporters here every night. Have you seen anything in the newspaper I've said against theaters? No. Then why would you bring up the subject? Oh, I just suppose you'd be against the theater. Well, what made you think that? Well, do you ever go? No. Well, why don't you go to the theater? Well, said Mr. Moody, I have something better. I'd sooner go out on the street and eat dirt than do some of the things I used to do before I was a Christian. I don't understand. Well, never mind, said D.L. Moody. When Jesus Christ has the preeminence in your life, you'll understand it all. He didn't come here to tell us what we couldn't do or where we couldn't go and lay down a lot of rules, he came to give us new life. Once you love him, you'll take delight in pleasing him. But Mr. Moody, if I become a Christian, can I continue to go to the theater? Yes, he said, you can go to the theater just as much as you like if you are a real true Christian so long as you can go with his blessing. I'm very glad you're not a narrow-minded Christian, she said to Mr. Moody. Well, he concluded, just so long as you can go to the theater for the glory of God. If you're a Christian, you'll want to do whatever will please him. Amen. Mr. Moody said, 
I really believe she became a Christian that day. But as she was leaving him at the door, she said, I'm not going to give up the theater, Mr. Moody. <laughs> a few days later, she came back, and this is what she said, Mr. Moody, I understand now all that you'd said about the theater. I went the other night with a large party, but when the curtain lifted, everything looked different. I told my husband, I'm not going to stay here. He said, don't make a fool of yourself. Everyone's heard that you've been converted to Moody, the Moody meetings. Please don't make a fool of yourself here in front of our friends. But I said, I've been making a fool of myself all my life. And Mr. Moody, I got up and left. In telling the story, Moody added, what had changed? Had the theater changed? <laughs> no. But she now had something better. She'd been made new. And that's it. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. The Lord sets apart him that is godly for himself. He changes us on the inside. We begin to love things we once loathed. We begin to loathe things we once loved. That's sanctification. It works its way through all the areas of our life. Not just the area of entertainment, but all areas. And God begins to have his way as we say, Lord, I want to please you. And he shows us what's not pleasing to him. That's what the Bible is saying when all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, what we believe, what's right. But for reproof, what's not right in our life, what I need to change, what I need to get out. For correction, that's how to get it right. How do I make the adjustment in this area of my life or this area of my life? And then instruction in righteous, how I can keep my life right so I can keep in pleasing with Him. Because otherwise I'm grieving His Spirit. Otherwise I can't be filled with His Spirit and walking wrong. Brother Miller, when he was here, talked about the God's will for you is to be saved. Once you're saved, God's will is for you to be Spirit-filled. And once you're Spirit-filled, God's will for you is to be sanctified. Don't try to be sanctified unless you're Spirit-filled. You'll never do it. But if you're saved and not Spirit-filled tonight, you're not in God's will. His will is for you to be spirit-filled, no doubt about it. And so uh, this is what the Lord is teaching us here in Psalm 4, verse 4, we find, Stand in awe. I love verse 3. I, I hate to even leave it. But know that the Lord has set apart him. He's set apart him that is godly for himself. And the Lord will hear what I call unto him. Why? Because he hears our voice. He, he knows who is his. I watch you on the playground. I watch at the Youth Congress all the kids doing different things, but there was a certain, certain young lady I had my eye on, because she's mine, and Caitlin was in the youth, a hundred and some youth, and I was wanting to keep up where she's at, what's she doing, I wanted to see when she was playing the, the, the archery tag, or they wanted to keep up, why, because she's mine, my eye's on her, and the Lord says, you're mine, my eye's on you, I'm watching you, you're my sheep. You're mine. You're part of my fold. See, Isn't that wonderful? Verse 4, stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Selah. See, David saw sanctification working two things in his life. First, it brought a new quality of life. This new quality was awe. This new part of his life that now he stood in awe. Most of us, instead of Stepping back and looking at God, we start talking. We start running down someone. We don't like this. We start talking bad about that. I believe this standing in awe is the missing dimension in much of our spiritual life today. Standing in awe. True worship. Not, not in awe of our problem. David's not saying, stand in awe of this big problem we've got on our hands. He's saying, stand in awe of God that is greater than our problem. God that is going to fix this. I don't know how. Everything looks like the odds are stacked against us, but God is greater and He is going to work here. Stand in awe. We need an awe-inspiring vision of the holiness and purity of God such as makes sin a horror and a shame. See, it brought a new quality of life, but not only that, the last part of verse 4, it brought a new quietness to life. The Bible says there, Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Be still. That word still means silent. Be quiet. 
I'm right with you. Some of us have the gift of gab, and we've talked when we should have been quiet. We've said things that we should have never said, even to our spouse at times. We've discouraged their heart. He says, look, commune with your own heart. Some of the times our problem is, and we're getting to it in the Sermon on the Mount, is what we're talking about is someone else's sin. And God said, you better commune with your own heart first. You better check out. Get that beam out of your own eye before you start dealing with anyone else's moat. You better check it out. Hey, commune with your own heart upon your bed. Be still. One writer said it literally means shut up. I didn't say that's what the one writer said. God would have us shut up, be silent. Get off this treadmill of our talking, da, 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 this verbose that we need. A, we have a God that has an answer. Lord, I'm, I'm going to be quiet. Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get my eyes on you. I'm going to stand in awe of who you are. And Lord, now we're listening to what you say. We're looking for our shepherd's answer for this problem. Oh, may God help us. We're spinning our wheels on this treadmill, going nowhere. We're, we're, we've got it all figured out. We're running our mouth about everything. But, oh, whoa, 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 stand in awe. Hey, commune with your own heart upon your bed. Get alone with God. Be still. Listen. God has something to say. Listen. Some of us, we've got too much talking going on. We can't listen to God. And the Lord help us. He has something to say. Number three, we see sacrifice. Look at verse 5. Offer the sacrifice of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. Now, the sacrifices of righteousness is interesting. This is a very special kind of sacrifice. In the Old Testament, there was basically two kinds of sacrifice. There was a sacrifice that they would come, and it was a sin offering. I messed up. I did this, I did that, and now they're offering for their sin. But there was another type of sacrifice, and it was... A sweet, savor sacrifice. It was, it was an offering of the Lord. It was a praise. It was, it was God's goodness. And there's basically three types of these. Now, he's talking about a righteous sacrifice. This is not a sin offering. This is something because of righteousness. Notice, offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. He, he, David knew, I'm not standing in sin. I'm standing in righteousness Absalom's in sin. All the people following Absalom have rised up against the Lord's anointed. I'm not king because I was stronger. I'm king because God anointed me king. And though they want to point, the devil wants to bring up my past sins, God's forgiven me. And God's going to fix this. This is, this is something that Absalom's doing. I'm not in the position to take control. I'm at God's mercy. But I'm going to sacrifice to him righteous sacrifice. I'm seeking the Lord. And Lord, I don't know how you're going to fix this, but unless you're going to take me out and I'm still living, you're going to put me back on the throne. You gave me the throne. It's yours. And I know what Absalom's doing is not right. And he's lying. And what's being said is a lie. And, and here's the sacrifice. It's interesting. The sacrifice of a righteous saint. Not, not the sacrifice of a repentant sinner. David has in mind that sweet savor sacrifice, this righteous saint sacrifice. There's three types of offerings in the Old Testament you'd find on this. You find the burnt offering. Now, the burnt offering was all for God, every part of it. It was burnt up, and the smoke would rise to the Lord. It was a picture of Christ's passion, his death, burial, his resurrection. It spoke of Christ giving his all on the cross. Complete devotion, unreservedly. Obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The burnt offering. Then there was the meal offering. And the meal offering, it was this evenly ground flour that was flawless in its texture. It was good gluten, you know. Uh, flawless, smooth, pure. It pictured the life of the Lord. It's pure. No matter where you touch in the Lord's life, it's perfect. No matter what part, perfect. Perfection. See? It pictures Christ's perfection. Amazing. And then there was a third offering, the peace offering. Now this was interesting. The peace offering had an idea of the worshiper enjoying a meal with God. A peace offering. The peace offering was the basis for God and the worshiper to join together in the ceremonial meal. 
It pictured Christ's presence. It pictured us supping with him and fellowshipping with him as Christ has called us in this wonderful fellowship. It was a holy occasion, but it was also a happy occasion, a time with him. In verse 5, he says, offer the sacrifices of righteousness. (laughs) Burn offering. What does the Lord's passion mean to us? In light of Calvary, how should I live? In light of Calvary, how should we live? Live a crucified life. Lord, it's not mine. It's all yours. A whole unreservedly giving myself to him. The meal offering, what does the Lord's perfection mean to you? He's perfect. He's without spot. He's taken all your spot, all your sin, all your corruption, and he's given you his robe of righteousness. Can I ask, how should we live in light of that? You ever borrow someone's outfit? I got back from a trip with the teens. My brother was three years younger than me. Finally, now was in the teen group. I don't remember where we went, but we came back on one of those long bus rides back. And, and my brother, we were doing silly stuff on the bus, which guys are, want to do, right? And uh, he gets down. He's, he's been down. He's got his, these light khaki pants on. And he gets down the bus floor, and, and he's just doing stupid stuff and his pants are just trash they're nice docker but really really light khaki you know almost white ones really light i told my mom i said we 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 got our clothes a lot of times at the thrift store and man if you had clothes i mean you saw one of us kids spill something we got soaps on our pants you'd be you know we'd be dipping in water i mean i still do that to this day we're getting spot off because we don't have many nice clothes and the ones we want want to keep nice we're teenagers we want to look good i was laughing to my mom i said he ruined his pants. Those are, they're, they're ruined. There's no way. I mean, they're filthy. My brother comes in laughing later, just laughing. And he, I, he realized, I don't know if he knew all along, he said, they're your pants. He was wearing my pants. I was not happy. He, they still laugh about that to this day. He was wearing my pants. Well, if you borrow something from someone else, you ought to take extra good care of it. It's not yours. We've received his robe of righteousness. And God says he's looking for a bride that will be without spot, without wrinkle in that day, blameless. How should we live? We should live a corresponding life, a life just like his, a life that we would allow the Holy Spirit of God to make us just like him. Let him fill us. And then there's this peace offering. What does the Lord's presence mean to you? He's made it plain all through the scriptures. He desires us to have fellowship with him. He's calling, come, all through the scriptures, come. The last chapter, come. The spirit and the bride say, come. The Lord desires us to come to him. Come. We should live. How should we live in light of that? A communing life. Not just when we come to the Lord's table, but every day, communing with him and him with us. Communing life. Oh, this is... The sacrifice that the Lord desires. We're we're a people for himself. We are the ones he's desired for himself. Uh, There's certain cups, maybe even certain coffee mugs you would offer to your guests, but there's a certain mug, and you know which one, that you use. And it's your mug. And you don't offer it to anyone else, and if you found your kids scooping the cat food with it, or or doing something else, you'd be like, no, 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 that's my cup. The Lord has reserved us. We're not just like anyone else. We're for himself. Think of that. Why would he want us? But he's put his favor on our life. Pretty amazing. Fourth thing we see here in this is a song. Look at verse 6. There be many that say, who will show us any good? Lord, lift thou up the light of thy countenance upon us. Thou hast put gladness in my heart. More than in the time that their corn and their wine increase. This is like someone wishing for the good old days here. Verse 6. The good old days. He's saying, someone, who will show us any good? (laughs) Someone said, the good old days are a mix, a combination of a bad memory (laughs) and a good imagination. That's the good old days. What kind of good were the people looking for? Who's going to show us any good? What do you want? What, what, what good were they looking for here? 
What were they desiring? What was this good they wanted? They were still with their king. They were still in right relationship with the Lord. What, what good did they want? Material wealth? Comfort? Here they are out in the wild. Peace? Security at any price? Was that what they wanted? Or did they want a godly king? Or even greater, did they want God's favor, God himself? I can imagine there were people going around in the camp with gloomy looks on their face, wondering, did we make the right choice here? Did we follow the right guy? Did we pick the winner? Did we get on the right bandwagon here? Is this going to be the king that wins? See, if there's one thing that should characterize the life of believers, a song. Singing, a song, happy, a Christian should be happy. Singing, praising the Lord. He put a new song in my mouth, even praise and to my lips, hey, everything's going our way. Zippity doo dah, right? Zippity day. Everything's going our way. Can I say this? Despite the horrible circumstances in your life, everything's going our way. You say, you don't know what I'm dealing with today. The Watkins family are talking about the death of their father. But you know what? For the Christian, everything's going our way. No matter you lost your job. Everything's going my way. Why? I have a shepherd. I have a God. My job's not what take, took care of me all these years. God did. I still have a father. My father is seated on the right hand, and he's the same yesterday and today and forever. He'll never leave me nor forsake me, see. Everything's going our way. Bad circumstances, circumstances notwithstanding, it's all going my way. I know Christ. Heaven's my home. Hell's not a possibility for me. My sins have been forgiven. I have a Savior that loves me. They wanted to see in the camp. They wanted to see rather than believe. But David wanted them to see what he could see. He said, Lord, verse 6, lift thou up the light of thy countenance upon us. Lord, would you smile on us? Lord, would you help them to see what I can see, to see the Lord? He gives joy. David could even write a song in the midst of all this. Here he is writing a song. Think of it. He could write a song. I hate, he could sing a song even with tears coming down his cheek as his sons rebelled against him, turned the kingdom against him. Absalom wanted to kill his father and would have. If he had the opportunity, he would have killed his dad. Yet he's singing. How? Verse 7, thou hast put gladness in my heart. <laughs> he could sing. They needed to see what David was seeing. They needed the Lord. David is saying, my joy today that God has given me is better than a wedding feast. It's better than the plentiful harvest on celebration holiday. That's what he's talking about in verse 7. Thou hast put gladness in my heart more than in the time that their corn and their wine increased. When they had the celebration of a plentiful harvest, when they had a wedding feast, he says, I've got more joy today than that. How? God put joy in my heart. <laughs> God's made me happy. Why? Because the Lord is my joy. He is my happiness. See the Lord. See, David's spirit was soaring. After all, what had he lost? What had he lost? I'm sure one of the men would have jumped up quick to say, What have you lost? How about a palace? A, a table loaded with food we used to eat at? What have you lost? How about money? Where's all your gold? Where's, your, where's, your, where's all your store of gold and silver? Where is it all that? What have you lost? David, nah, mere material things. And someone else said, all right, David, fine. I think he's lost it. What do you have left? What do you have left? David answered, I have God. I have everything. Those things were not my inheritance. He's my inheritance. I have God. I have the Lord. Wow. Look out here. <laughs> You're sleeping under the stars. But his joy was not in goods. His joy was in God. Goods come and go. But he recognized, as long as I have God, I've got everything. And fifthly, last thing, we're done. Security. 
Verse 8, I'll both lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, only makest me to dwell in safety. Only Lord, the Lord could do that. Absalom's forces were massing. Many people had chosen to stay with Absalom, thinking he's got the upper hand, he's got the army with him. Guess who had trained the army? David had. These guys were good. David was a warrior. What are you going to do, David? I'm going to bed. I'm going to sleep. <laughs> he enjoyed personal peace. I'll both lay me down in peace and sleep. And by the way, perfect peace for thou, Lord, only. Makest me dwell in safety. Only. Only God can do that. David was secure. Not an arrow could reach him. Not an arrow could touch him. He was secure as long as he rested in the arms of his shepherd. He went to sleep. You know normally how he was sleeping? In the palace, there would be armed guards walking up and down the corridors. There was guards at the gate. There were people protecting him. But he says, I can sleep even greater, even better, even more sound right here. Why? Because the Lord, he's watching over me. If God wanted me dead, I'd already be dead. I don't know why the Lord's allowing this, but I'm trusting the Lord. I'm the Lord's. He's made the righteous for himself. He'll hear me when I call on him. Isaiah 26, 3, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. You know what he's trying to tell these guys? Verse 5, Offer the sacrifice of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. Hey, verse 3, Know this. You want to know something. Know that the Lord hath set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call upon him. Yeah, I don't have the priest back in Jerusalem to offer a sacrifice. Absalom's offering all these sacrifices back in Jerusalem right now, making a big show, but it's not sincere. The Lord won't receive it. But God will hear my prayer. God's kept the righteous for himself. And you know what? Put your trust in the Lord, guys. Let's go to sleep. <laughs> Powerful for himself. Let's bow in prayer, will you?